first, I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules. I know it's not the ideal time, you know, weeknight, 7 o'clock, we're all things to do, homework with the kids, but uh, I appreciate y'all coming out to listen to this presentation, um, just pretty much going over who we are and addressing a couple of issues, but the chief issue uh, that we hear about pretty much every day is the discoloration of our water. Um, before I continue, I'd like to introduce some special guests. Uh, um, Ms. Josie Papas, this is Senator, State Senator uh, Zaffarini's sister. Okay. Essex Water Board President, Mr. John Larison, there over there in the back. <laughs> Herb Williams, the general manager, my boss. Um, <laughs> and uh, we also have some of our <coughs> staff, so Jackson Richie, thanks for showing up today. So. <laughs> so, uh, on, uh, these are the guys that keep the water on here, everyone. And so you're going to see a picture today of what they were doing to keep everybody in water. So, uh, with that, we're going to start. Okay, uh, this is a good one. I don't know if turning off the lights is going to hurt that. Yeah, it'll be fine. Everybody get a seat? Okay. Kind of dark here. All right. It was a challenge for me here, but. All right, so I'll let what we're going to talk about. Um, who we are, the water source, uh, regulations, how water gets to you all. Uh, speaking of iron content, closing, closing remarks, and I don't know if you can't really see this here, but this was a, um, a water conservation uh, theme that was done at a school. And I, I forget, uh, her, what grade was this, the first one? Third grade. Third grade. And so they told me to come up with a cartoon that talks about conserving water. And I don't know if you can really see it here, but they drew like, a little picture here. And the, the drop is asking the other, what'd you do this past weekend? And this one says, I got wasted. And so, you know, it's, so it wasn't quite, not the same definition. Yeah, third grade. So, yeah, so, yeah that's, we've been passing this around, and it was like, you probably need to pay royalties to this kid because we've been passing this around to all of our water folks. Okay. Sir, on, so, the, on that first page, there was no point for, for audience questions. Uh, yes, sir, please, at the end, uh, we'll, we'll have a Q&A. We'll have a Q&A at the, at the very end. Okay, so first off, um, did some introduction to everybody else, but a little bit about myself. I'm assistant general manager. Um, I did 26 years from 84 retiring, uh, and I joined SS Water Corporation in April of this year. And uh, since then, we've been working to uh, develop uh, more of an outreach program, and this is, is something that we've been uh, concentrating on. So this is the first part of hopefully a more uh, a timely or more often, or a series that we put on more often to try to get word out there to help folks understand what it is that we do and what we're doing to uh, treat or mitigate some of the issues that, and concerns that y'all have. Bear with me and we'll work with seat. All right. So Essence Water Supply Corporation is a member-owned corporation. So I'm assuming that everyone here, except for a few, are on the system, yes? So if that's so, that means that everyone, you're, you're an owner of this corporation. Okay. You come in, you uh, do the membership application. The reason why we ask for a warranty deed or something that shows that you're a property owner is because that's part of the rule of becoming a member of a water supply corporation in the state of Texas. And so everyone's a member, and that's how the water, the water supply corporation works. Um, another part of that, we are nonprofit. So I know I've heard some folks talk about uh, that we're in Rod Water to make money and that kind of thing. That is not true. We are a nonprofit organization. We have a, a nonprofit. Uh, tax ID number, so when we buy things, we don't pay any kind of tax on that, uh, and that saves our membership, us, uh, money. 
So just want to put that out there. We are not a for-profit enterprise. Uh, whatever money that comes in from water sales, uh, we call that retained earnings, and we just put that right back in the system. Keep the lights on, we uh, payroll parts, whatever is required to run the system, and the rest is either invested back in the system. No, that's yeah, pretty much it for future uh, projects, and I'll get to that as well. Uh, some of that money we put towards that. Let's see. Okay, so again, hard to see here, but pretty much SS Water started in 1971, and with one, and there was one well, 200 connections, and about 400 folks. So in the water business, we go by connections, the number of connections. And that dictates, or that's how we know uh, what size, have an idea of what size system is being served. That was 1971 by 200 connections. Today, we're approaching 6,000 connections. And for any any of you, y'all been out here for some for some time, know that there's a lot of growth, a lot of growth, a lot of folks coming out. And so it's only a matter of time. I think uh, we're less than 100 memberships away from hitting that 6,000 number. Not all those accounts are active, but still it's a significant, significant uh, number. Uh, as far as rural water systems go, we are considered a medium-sized uh, concern. Uh, there are some water systems that have as few as 25 connections, all the way up to you know, hundreds of thousands of connections, like down in the valley, um, and everything in between. So we're a medium-sized uh, entity. for every person that walks that works on the system. And so that ensures that we know what we're doing. Water is a serious business. We take that very seriously. Uh, there's a number of regulations we have to apply or uh, abide by, uh, especially when it comes to disinfecting. I'll talk a little bit about that. But the bottom line is there's over 100 years of experience serving it. That's, uh, that's quite a bit. And we are very fortunate to have that level of experience to be able to do something like this in a matter of hours. So we're very fortunate. All right, where our water comes from. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Carrizo Wilcox Aquifer. And if not, we'll talk briefly about it. Essentially, it's what we call an artesian aquifer, which 
essentially means that the water there is under pressure. There's all these layers, I know it's hard to see, but this little sliver up here, that's the carrizo, right? That's the water that we're getting from right now, very top layer. And then there's layers all the way underneath that. And this here, let's say it's the back part, and then that all the way here, it goes all the way down to the coast and underneath the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a massive aquifer. And it goes all the way into uh, Arkansas, I'm sorry, Louisiana. And parts of Arkansas, too, with some of the aquifers. Not, not so much this one, but huge aquifer. And that's where we get our water from. Let's see. Yes? What we're seeing right now is uh, counties with the low cost of freeze over the floods. Right. All these here, yeah, these are all the counties. Right? At least in Texas. Let's see. So water. Uh, let me back up a little bit. The water that we get right now, I'll call it sweet water. It's very high quality, um, especially in this part of, of the state that we're in. Uh, for some folks who drill the well here, and they get water two, three hundred foot, which is pretty good, as opposed to some places, other places in the state, where they have to drill down thousands of feet to get water. Another thing with that too, the further down you drill, the water gets hot. And so they have to cool it out, cool it down before it even goes in the system. We don't have those issues. We have a very, very good source of water up here at the top. Uh, but there might come a time, uh, we don't know when that is, but we might have to drill down or in other places where the water is not sweet, if you will. Uh, it's what's called brackish water. And brackish water has more minerals in it. It might taste, you know, a little different, and it, it, it will require more processing before it can be distributed. And so we'll get there at some point, but not right now. Right now we have a fantastic source of water. Uh, it's not hard. Uh, how many folks lived in San Antonio before coming out here? Okay, a number, uh, I did, I had a house in San Antonio 14 years. Uh, that water is hard. If you do not have a water softener, you will get like rocks in your spade. I mean, it's, it's pretty rough stuff. Um, and that's because they have a lot of limestone, calcium. We don't have that up here. Uh, but what we do have is iron, and I'll get to that here. Okay, this red rock here, I'm sorry, the, this red here, that is the recharge zone, and then all the, kind of hard to see here, that's the outcrop. So pretty much water gets in the ground, and it goes through the ground down to the layers here of clay or bedrock or whatnot, and the water runs down. Uh, we are a groundwater source. That's why we're talking so much about this. All the water that we get comes from the ground. There are some water systems that are a combination of both, uh, rainwater, surface water, and groundwater. We get all of our water from the ground. We drill wells and we get it out of the ground. There are some water systems that have to buy their water from other entities. A large one by us is the Schertzegeen Local Government Corporation, uh, just up the road. Uh, they are a wholesaler for six other water systems. We don't have that. We produce our own water. And so we're fortunate there. Okay. All right, so water is not stable. All right, so a lot of folks are going to be like, talking. So water uh, is either aggressive or more acidic or more basic. Uh, if the water is acidic, it strips uh, things. And if it's more basic, it tends to leave things. Uh, our water, depending on where it comes out of, we have uh, nine wells. Depending on where it comes out of, what well is either more aggressive or more basic. And so we treat to have our water a little basic. So pH, or the potential or power of hydrogen, goes on the scale. It's measured in a scale from 0 to 14, with 7 being neutral. We try to keep our water a little bit above 7. In other words, we always want our water leaving something. If water strips something, that's not a bad thing. How many of y'all heard of Flint, Michigan? With the water issue. 
Okay, so that's what happened there. And long story short, they, uh, so for, well, from back, a couple of things. Number one, that system is far older than our system, right? So we were found in 1971. That system went back, I believe, turn of the century, which means they had a lot of lead pipes in that system. Uh, but they had a certain source of water. That lead pipe over many years was coated and was there. Uh, but the city of Flint changed their water source abruptly and did not treat that water to make it less aggressive. So the water they had was more basic, leaving something, right, it was a higher pH. The water, that new water source was a low pH. And so when that new water source went into their pipes, it stripped all the, the, the uh, inside the pipes, stripped them out. And that's how they got lead. Because the water was stripping out all those pipes because it was more acidic. And so that's why it's so important to maintain a good water balance. And that's what we do to ensure that we don't have that kind of issue. So we always have water, always living a little bit of something. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a bit when I'm done with the slideshow. So, treatment. So what we do um, for the iron, we add something called a phosphate. And keep it uh, easy to understand, essentially what this chemical does, it captures the iron so it doesn't oxidize. So, that the, so you can't see it. It kind of gets it, keeps it in control, so you don't really see the water, it's discoloration, and it coats it coats our water mains with the iron. And when it coats, it becomes red. So if you were to look at our water mains, and I'll have a, have a piece of the water main we cut out from the picture I showed you all earlier. Uh, when it comes out, you'll see it looks blood red. But that's the phosphate working to sequester or capture that iron so it doesn't run in the water. Uh, but when we have things like they were working today, working on the mains, if there's an abrupt change in pressure, uh, any number of things, it can disturb that coating. And that's why you get this colored water. And that's also why every, every member gets 2,000 gallons included in your base price so that you can flush the water to allow for this coating. And so I'll show you that over here in a little bit, what that looks like. bureaucracy, yes. Every one of these entities we have to comply with. Okay, from EPA, TCQ, all of these entities have a say in the water we deliver to y'all. So it's not a stretch to say that the water that we supply to you is better than bottled water because bottled water does not have to comply with all of these entities. They do not. We are tested every month, very strict training, or not training, uh, testing regimens to make sure that the water we provide meets all of these requirements. And even though we're considered a private member-owned corporation, we're kind of quasi-private because we still have to comply with all of these entities. And so we do that, and we do, I think, pretty well. And we'll see that here on the next slide. Okay, so these two here, so again, very busy slides, but here on the left is what's called our Consumer Confidence Report. By state law, we have to provide this once a year by 1 July. This is posted on our website, you can look at it anytime, and it shows uh, <coughs> certain water testing uh, results of our system. Uh, TC, this is, this, uh, these are not the tests that go into this. And this over here, the Texas Water Watch, which you all can access anytime. Let's go to Texas Water Watch, and this is a TCQ website. You can look, type in SS Water, and this will show up. And this is a very extensive, everything they test, all kinds of minerals, uh, things that are not regulated. And there's all kinds of tests that are done under our water. 
Uh, TCQ, they don't announce when they come, they just come out, take samples, and it appears here. And so we, it's part of the checks and balances that the state has to make sure that we're providing safe potable water to our population. And so this is on our website, and this is Texas Water Watch, they're always available to you at any time to see the water quality that we're providing. Okay, iron. Everyone wants to hear more about the iron. So, let's see, we talked a little bit about the phosphate earlier. So, we sequestered that, like I was saying, and that works well until it gets disturbed. Uh, there are some things that we are saving for, and I'll talk about that here in the end, um, more extensive water treatment. But yes, we are aware that this is an issue with the water source. Again, to refresh what we talked about earlier, all our water is groundwater. We get it up from the ground. That water, to get to where it is, um, it, comes, it comes from the atmosphere. So essentially, whatever water we have now has been around since the beginning of Earth. Right? The water never goes away. It's constantly recycled. Right? The thing with that is that, that water is only so much that's Real easily accessible and, uh, and, and uh, in a state that we can uh, process it to drink fairly easily. All right, so that water over time, it's called percolation and it goes to the ground. So essentially, the earth is a giant filter. And in our case, a lot of our wells are 300 foot. So that water goes down 300 foot, gets in the aquifer, and then at some point, we uh, drill it, drill a well, and get it out. As it goes down the ground, though, it collects all these minerals, a lot of minerals, and around here, a lot of iron. So that's why we have iron and water. It's just the source, the way that Carrizo Wilcox is. Some areas are worse than others. You can drill a well 100 foot apart, two different wells, and you'll have two different types of water. Depends on where you drill in that aquifer. Okay, so what we do to treat, we use uh, chlorine gas. Uh, the state requires that we have what's called a residual, which means exactly that. When they test the water at any tap, it has to be at least 0.2 parts per million of chlorine in the water. That tells the state that yes, we are treating with chlorine to kill um, <coughs> pathogens in the water to make sure it's safe. We also use sodium hydroxide, pretty nasty stuff, uh, if you get it on your skin. But that's what we use, of course, in appropriate amounts uh, to treat for pH balance. So if the water's aggressive, we bring it up to a little bit above 7, like we talked about earlier, to make sure that it leaves and doesn't strip. That's what that does. And then Aquamite, Aquamite is a name brand, but that is the uh, phosphate that we also add to the water to sequester the iron so it's not just floating around and really, really bad. That's what that chemical is. And this, these chemicals are not cheap. Uh, our budget's at least $200,000 a year to buy those chemicals. But again, that's what's required to make sure that we, uh, so that's the Pink Panther. <laughs> All right, um, but those are the things that are required by the state uh, to make sure that the water is potable. Now that chemical mix can change. For our area, that is what is sufficient. Other areas, they need to add more, maybe less. Um, for example, in San Antonio, they're getting a bunch of new water sources, and they have to actually make the water dirty. They have to add limestone and calcium in the water so that it doesn't strip the pipes, like we were talking earlier, so the water matches. So they have to actually make the water dirtier so it'll work in the system or make it harder. So we don't have those issues. And lastly, this is the last slide, what we are doing to mitigate 
the iron. So we take some of those retained earnings that we have anything left over after keeping the lights on, paying the bills, and we have been taking that money and saving it towards an ion filtration plant. Uh, right now we have just over a million and a half dollars in there. We're trying, hopefully we'll get to two million soon, but that's still short of, I don't know how much, it, it depends on what technology we go with, um, but in brief, they are not cheap. Uh, and when we do get to filtering water, um, there is a cost with that. We cannot, uh, we, we don't expect to maintain rates where they are now in order to raise the millions of dollars required to get this kind of filtration. Uh, but we are striving for that because it's better for our customers. There are two different, the two basic types of filtration. It's a bad picture, but this is a huge plant, right? This is a sand filtration. Basically, they use sand as a filtering media. Water goes to the sand. It's backwashed. They wash off the sand to get rid of uh, the minerals they're trying to filter out. Uh, and that's the way it works. One way that you can do filtering. And another way that we're looking at here on the right, or on y'all's right, it's a uh, type of reverse osmosis uh, filter. Essentially, it's forcing water into a media and the water coming out the sides in a, in a microscopic uh, form, fashion to clean the water. It's under pressure. Uh, these are proprietary here. It's a Canadian company we're looking at. But that's another technology. But bottom line is, this stuff is not cheap. We are working towards that because we know that will help go a long way towards mitigating some of the concerns folks have with iron in the water. Um, but yeah, we are aware, we are trying our level best to treat the water up to and including getting filtration plants, hopefully in the near future. And then with that, that's it. I'll turn the lights back on. Oh, before we get to questions, let me show you all uh, some of what I was talking about over here. So this here, this dried. Oops, show that. So this was a piece of the water main that you all saw in the picture that was cut out to connect the 12 inch to a 6 inch. This is dried, but when this was taken out, this was a blood red. And this is what the iron looks like in the water mains. It's, it bonds to the PVC, right? It's pretty thick PVC, but it coats in there so it's not floating in the water. But like today, when they cut through, uh, for a while, the folks out there in that area, Spring Valley, or folks who live out there, they probably had some discoloration until it flushed through because that coating was disturbing. You see, it's this iron. That's what it looks like. So there's an example here. And we also have examples of some meters that y'all have in the ground right now. There's two meters that we use. An older PMM style meter, the old school brass, with this connector that goes up to the radio. So well, there's been some confusion, I guess, with um, what we've been doing here. So the two meters that we have, the old school and then the newer, I Pearl plastic meters over there, those have been in the ground. We did not replace those. All we did is take off the touch reeds where the guys would go out there and physically have to touch each meter and that would take anywhere from five to seven days to do. We eliminated that time and went to radios that transmit data to us six times a day. So that not only saved hundreds of man hours that we can now reinvest into maintaining the system, taking care of y'all's water needs. Um, but it also saved um, call driving costs, all kinds of things, more efficient to be able to better serve y'all. And also with this, we have hour by hour readings on y'all's consumption. Huh. One thing we hope to do, uh, and again, it's at a cost, there, there's nothing free, um, is there's a customer service portal they were, we are looking into to where y'all will be able to log in uh, and see pretty much the same information that we see uh, y'all's usage. That's what they have. So we're looking at that hopefully in the not too distant future. 
Um, we do a cost benefit analysis to see if whatever we're charged to do that, that we have to pay a third party uh, web hosting fees uh, to be able to access this data pretty much while we're on the system. So we're looking at that to see if that's something that's uh, worth doing. Um, that's pretty much it for my brief. We kept it hit right 30 minutes, so that's that was the goal. Any questions uh, about what we talked about? Yes, sir. We live in Atkins, and from time to time there's a sulfur odor in the water. Can you address where that comes from? Yes, so that is, um, that odor, I'm sorry? Yes, thank you. Let's get it. Hydrosulfite onions. Right, the hydrosulfite gas, so that comes up from the water as well. Um, we recommend that when that happens, again, just to flush, but that's a natural occurring gas. It just smells bad. It's not bad for you, it's just it's a nuisance smell. So it's just something that comes out of the ground as well. So H2S isn't bad for you? Hydrogen sulfide gas? Uh, the gas just smells bad. So it's not, it's not, I mean I wouldn't stay there, you know, breathing it in, but but as, as it comes out of water, it's a nuisance. I'm sorry, sir? H2S gas is very bad. It will kill you. I mean, what level you smell it. So, the gas that, so that gas we're talking about, it's it's not the same thing. Because if it was, then we'd, we'd be hearing about uh, issues that come out of water. But as far as that smell goes, it's not, it's more of a nuisance type smell and not something that's toxic. So we would not let toxic gas into the system. You know, it's just, yeah, it's, that's something that we would, we would allow to happen. So it's more, more of a nuisance thing that needs to be flushed out, just as if you would for the iron. So is there like an allotted PPM, part per million on that, that the TCQ or somebody has? So if, uh, if there was, it'd be on, on that water watch. Okay. I can't recall right now, but it'd be on there. And it'd be tested, or whatever our result was, would be on there. Not a, a more like a rotten eggs. Rotten eggs, yes, thank you. More than one So, but it's not toxic, it just smells. Yeah, it's just a consequence of where the water is and where it comes up. Ma'am? How often do the storage tanks get flushed out? Oh, that depends on y'all. <laughs> um, so as an example, up until I think it was May, June, we were pumping on average think, a million and a half gallons a day uh, for the system to support membership, uh, which means that in the, the water in the tanks, uh, they'll stay in there maybe a few hours, you know, depending on how much demand is. Um, when the demand goes way up, so I think August, September, we were pumping almost double, what, uh, so almost 3 million gallons a day. And so when that happens, the water in the storage tanks, like those two big tanks we have on the camera 319, two big tanks there, that water can go through there in 30 minutes. It, it all depends on the demand. And those are half a million, half million gallon tanks. So that's like so, a monthly thing? Well, that's daily. I mean, it's constantly, it's constantly, the water doesn't sit there. It is constantly. Do you never drain the tank? Oh, oh, yes, sir, we do. Yes. Okay. I think that was the question. Oh, 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 was that, was that weird? Oh, once a year. And we have to, they're inspected, oh, yes. Yeah, that they have to be maintained. Again, state regulations. Yeah, they are inspected. At least the, once a year. Sir, the old timey meters used to, I guess it was an analog thing that would spin. It used to be easy to tell if you had a water leak. You could always tell if it's on our side of the meter or your guys' side of the meter. I guess if we shut the water off. So how can we determine how if we shut our water off and where the leak is if it's on our side of the meter or your side of the meter? So, so there's a couple parts to that. Um, let's start with the first part, telling if there's a leak. So the fastest way that we recommend to check to see if you have a leak is to make sure everything is turned off in your home. All the outside bibs, everything on the inside, uh, water heater, turn that all, everything's turned off, and then go all over your meter. So if you have the old PMM style with the brass, you see the number turning, then okay, you know that there's a leak somewhere. 
if you know everything is off. With the newer iPearls of plastic, it's a digital readout. So again, if you see the digits turning, then you know the water's going somewhere. Um, so there is a number turning on the Oh, yes, sir. It's a digital number. It'll just be, okay. it'll keep on rolling. And you can see uh, afterwards in the display what it looks like. Um, and I'm really glad you brought that up, too, because nothing will leak. So out here, we are on Sandy Low. Okay? Uh, a lot of sand, like a beach. And if there's a water leak, especially if you have long runs of pipe from the meter to your home, it can be tough to see if you have a leak because that water goes straight down. It goes straight down, and you won't even, might not even see it. And we have a lot of calls, you know, because we'll see, you know, there's continuous assumption. How many of y'all have gotten calls from the machine, right? And so what we do, we get a report every morning, and we look at that continuous assumption. And we get that alert if your meter has run, has had water going constantly through it for at least 24 hours. So that means the water is constantly flowing through that meter for 24 hours. If that happens, we get, a, we get an alert. And then we put it in the machine, machine calls, and that's how we let y'all know, like, hey, there's water continually going through your meter. Please check it out. Um, <coughs> with that briefly, too, um, with this system that we put in, um, we've saved the me us. I'm on the system, too. We have saved almost 100 million gallons of water by having those calls and letting folks know like, hey, this is running as opposed to before when that leak might have gone on for a month because we didn't know I mean, until we go out there and touch read and see what the difference is. That's the way it used to be. So now we can see that, you know, not instantaneously, but <coughs> a few days is better than a month. And so that system that we have allows us to do that. Uh, but going back to your question, um, with the uh, how to fill a leak. So turn everything off, meter's still running, uh, you know there's a problem somewhere. Generally speaking, if you see, see it's tough. If, if there's so many different situations. Um, if you can't find the leak, it's best just to call a plumber, call a professional, and have to do it that way. Uh, Jackson, no suggestion? Yes. Um, it sounds like take it. All right, so on these meters, if you have these brass ones up here, and they're kind of hard to find, you know, if you have your box full of sand, dig it up, ain't, that, ain't too hard. There's a red dial up here, and that thing will spin, I will say clockwise, and that will always tell you, even if you can't read those numbers, sometimes that can get scratched up from the sand. That thing will always spin, no matter if there's water running, it'll just keep spinning. It could be a leaky toilet. It can be your something in your home. It can be on that, like he said, on that water line going to your house. You know, and yes, we have a lot of blow sand all of that way on Ranch Country down 34 to 32 down in here. Most of this in here is all black sand, all black dirt and clay. Over there on 97, it's all red dirt. But also, he's right, it just, the water will just drop out and just sink. But there's also something called a clay line. That's when you get down a certain depth and then you just hit nothing but clay, that's bottom. Eventually that has to stop and that has to go somewhere. And that's when it's going to come back up. When, you, when you're looking for your line or anything like that, if some of y'all, y'all don't have nice cut grass or you do, either or, you're going to notice a wet spot eventually. You're going to see either grass growing up or you're going to see... Uh, like a wet spot where it's starting to like sink. There's a there's a gentleman in I want to say the reserves, and I don't I don't want to point him out nothing, but it's really def difficult for this particular customer to tell if he has a leak because his yard is constantly saturated with water because he's constantly um, watering his grass through a well of his own. And that makes it much more difficult for him to find a leak if he has one on his system, on his line. And this other one here, I'm sorry, I didn't make it off track. But on this one here, there is a there is a little, it's kind of hard to see. There's a little word on here that says gall or gallons or what have you. And there's a little circle next to it. That light, there's a little dot in there. If that's on, that's water's moving through it. And there is a, there's, I think it's a, 
a magnetic light or something like that that shoots through there. It's not a paddle like this one. And that's what really tells water to go through there. But it's, if you can find the water line, all you got to do is go to your meter, make sure no one's using the restroom, that no one's taking a shower, no one's doing any of that, and then just walk back towards your home. Walk back towards your home. It doesn't. It's probably not going to be along your driveway. It might go straight off to the corner. It, it's all depends on your plumber, whoever did it before. If you, I understand not a lot of people want to spend money on plumbers because they can get pretty expensive. But you can go on and keep following the line best you can. That grass will grow. It'll be greener. It'll be soggier. It'll be wet. You might just fall right into the sand hole. I mean. It's, it just takes time to find it, and within 24 hours, that's, that's a heck of a lot better than waiting a whole month, because that can make a real big mess. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Sir. So, my water bill was over double what it normally was two months in a row before I got notified. And my water didn't run for 24 hours straight. It didn't run for six hours straight. When my sprinkler system got a mine of its own, I, I had to do a complete reset. But I mean, I've got $2,000 worth of bills right here that I've got to pay because I use the water, which I completely understand. But is there anything that you guys were, are willing to put in place to, to give some better notification? Because I mean, I got notified, but the damage was already done. And so, I mean, not, I mean, you know, you've got all these new systems and stuff like that, but I mean, is there any way that we can get notified before I get $2,000 worth of bills? Because so, I mean, I can promise you I've never, never tried to rack up $2,000 worth of bills. So do you have a, a smart irrigation system? I do. Okay. So there's a reason why I asked that. So a number of folks do. And in your case, even though you might not have changed the basic parameters, it's a smart system, so it will have internet access. The system is going to do what it thinks is appropriate to save the grass, make sure it's green. Well, it's not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll so basically it'll turn on and off when it thinks it should be on or off. Right? And so uh, we've had a number of folks with the same issue. And what we found is that we just went back and did some research. And even uh, if the owner left the basic parameters of the system the same, go off twice a week at this time, <clears throat> that smart meter will adapt to the weather. So for example, in May, I uh, wish I would have brought that here, in May the average temperature was like 89 and there was like three inches of rain. And then it progressed all the way through the summer until September where the average temperature was like 95 with the 20 hundred plus days and point something of rain. That system, it sounds like probably adapted to that and watered more. No. Uh, we, we have the data, we looked at that, and that's with those smart meters, we've been seeing that as a trend. Um, so it's, again, without knowing all the situation, it sounds like that's probably what happened. Um, as far as notification goes, um, like I said, this is a new system. We've only had this in place for six months up until our ability to set parameters to where we get notice. Um, up until then, we wouldn't have known you had that issue for 30 days. Yeah. So what we have now is, is better than nothing. Um, unfortunately, we can't, while we wish we could get to that level of detail, for every customer, the, the, we, we just can't. We, we don't have uh, the manpower and the, and the resources to get to that kind of resolution uh, for everyone's uh, system or whatever circumstance to give them like, up to the second notice. We do the best we can, but it's really difficult with all 17,000 plus people in the system. And where that number comes from, the state says for every water connection, there are 2.8 people. I don't know what a 0.8 person is, uh, but that's what the state says, so that's where we get that number. I know it's not the best the, answer, but the, the first month my sprinkler system wasn't messed up, and it's set the same way as it was last year, and it was double. And, and so I think that, I mean, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
but you know I've, I've heard of a lot of people having increased pressure in their house and different things like that uh, I know my shower pressure's increased and I'm just wondering if it has something to do with the pressure you know and maybe watering the exact same amount but if you've got a higher pressure on your line I'm going to use more water uh, well, not if not if the pressure regulator is working. So there's no if pressure you're, regulator on my sprinkler system. No, but there's a regulator on the meter going to your house. So if that regulator has gone bad, it, that could that could be an issue. But every meter, there is a pressure regulator. I'm not on really worried one. about the amount of water that I'm using in my house. I use the most water with my sprinkler system. So I mean, if you guys have increased your pressure, then I'm I'm going to use more water with my sprinkler system being set the same way as it was last year. So I mean, I'm going to use more water this year than I did last year if you've increased the pressure. So uh, uh, We have not increased pressure. The only way we could increase pressure, I don't know where, where do you live at? Uh, I live in the <coughs> Where? Eden Cross. Eden Cross. So the only way I could raise the pressure going to that main is to raise the Whispering Oak tank. Because everything we have out here in, in most of the subdivision is called static pressure. And it's based on the elevation of the water. So for every foot of water, there is 0.433 pounds of pressure to your meter. So if there's 100 foot of water from the top of the water to your meter, that means there's 43.3 pounds of pressure there. And the only way I can raise or lower the pressure is to raise or lower that tank. So the, the pressure is constant to your water. Head. Do we know what the pressure is? Uh, yes, sir. You could call me in my office. We could pull a work order when we install the meter, and we could tell you exactly what that pressure is. Okay. I've been waiting for a week or so for y'all to call me to come out and schedule the. Uh, we were going to check the pressure there at my meter, and I still hadn't heard from anybody. Yeah. Well, if you've moved the regulator up close to your house and put your sprinkler system on full main pressure, uh, then you could call the office and just have somebody look up the installation. Uh, work order, and we can tell you exactly what that pressure is, and it hasn't changed since then. You said the pressure won't change during your harvest time, but you see. That's correct, sir. Uh, it, the only the only way the pressure changes, pressure changes, is when the the level of the tank drops. Yeah, right. You said the pressure will be the same when you have 100 people on that line. Well, the state, the state regulates how many people you can have on a certain size for that particular reason. So if I have a two-inch water main, I can only have 10 people on that, on that main. If I have a six-inch main, I can have 250 people on it. But yeah, the engineers look at all that stuff and look at friction loss and all that kind and see how many people we can effectively serve on that, on that line to maintain pressure. <coughs> Where do you live at, sir? Sir, where do you live at? I'm uh, And then uh, there are days that it'll you know, spread all the way to closer the to where closer to where it connects to 87, or closer to Florida. County Road 32. I'm sorry, way out there in Pinecaster. Yeah, 3432. You could call me and we could talk because there are parts of uh, 3432 and Presidents Park and stuff like that that's on what we call a pressure system. So, yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Get by. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we have to maintain uh, a minimum of uh, 35 psi to your water. And so that's the requirement for the state. We like to we like to put at least 45 pounds to the water. Uh, but there are some parts of the system that are higher elevation that I can't reach with gravity, like that static pressure. So I put those folks on, on a pressurized system. Also, today, like I said, they cut the main. We didn't have a physical range. Yes, this was a big line. There's other days that we don't see any work going on there. Uh, again, it could be the flow of the water. It uh, could be uh, excess. Going to the line. Uh, 
there, there's several things to talk about. So um, in the winter time, it's, it's getting to be that time of year where everybody's turning off their irrigation systems and they're going to be using domestic water for showering, washing clothes, things like that. The water gets pretty, you know, stagnant in the pipes and that coating builds up over those winter months. And I can always tell when we're going to start getting some calls because when I'm at HEB, I see people buying a lot of plants and flowers and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, oh no. Because here comes the irrigation systems, here comes the watering, and that's something you're you're able to do, but when it increases the velocity in the lines, it's going to break some of that coating loose, and you're going to have some discoloration. And uh, we have a, a, a pamphlet on a line of how to deal with iron. I live on the system too, and I actually live in front of Country Hills, and I live on a dead-end line. And anybody that lives on a dead-end line is going to get more discoloration than people that don't that live on a loop line. And that's why when we uh, deal with these uh, developers these days, we make them loop those lines. So if they're putting in a subdivision, um, like uh, the settlement's going in off of 319, they have to loop that water line. They can no longer put a dead-end line because dead-end lines to us equals poor water quality. So um, my neighbors know me. You know, they start having some discoloration, they call me, I look, I go look at my, my uh, faucets, I say, yep, we have some discoloration. I go out and do some flushing, and when that doesn't help, and I say flushing, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, it doesn't clear up the water in the house, they're right in the work order the next morning. We need to know about it. I've got, I wish you could come by and see the computer system, the smaller SCADA system. We have pH levels, we have chlorine levels. Uh, these guys that go home, they go home with a cell phone and a, and a smart tablet. And if anything goes out of whack, like the tank levels drop out or, and, and wells aren't coming on to fill the tanks, and all that happens automatically. If something gets out of parameter, we get a notification for hundreds of, of uh, parameters that we've got on the system. One thing I don't have on the system is a discoloration engine. And, but I got about 6,000 customers out there that will call me and tell me I've got a discoloration issue. And that's what I need. And don't be afraid to call us. I know they really want that, but we can call you every day and let you know that he's discolored. And, but to that point, though, the gentleman was saying that, that the, the water quality is better than bottled water. And that's, that's an assault to intelligence. If you were to take bottled water from an animal and put it in the store, there ain't a person in here or anywhere that would buy that water. Horrible. When it's discolored, yes, sir. It doesn't look good. It is. But it's still safe to drink. And, and if you're having a constant problem, you call us <coughs> and we'll come out and go to your house and see what the issue is, and we, we will solve it for you. Well, obviously, it's obviously, obviously that I probably have a lot of. Oh, sorry, the, I have another question here. No, no. I have never seen it. Never seen it. I'm in Roseville. I've never seen water day. The only thing I see y'all do is flush lines every day. I see them next door to every all my neighbors complaining about the color of the water. And the bills, my bills, the gentleman here talking about double, I trip, quadruple. Yeah, we, we have no control In the last over how much water you use. I understand you don't yeah. have control, but you have control of something, something happened. I didn't change anything. Something happened. And now I'm paying $800. Something happened. Is the rate to go up? No, no rates increased since 2016. So uh, you could you could come talk to me, and I can show you exactly what happened. Because I'll have an hour by hour report of what of, of what you use. It's the same thing, same thing that I've had with my my sprinkler system. I always have. So yes. So if you have any questions, if you come to the office, yeah, we can show you. Yeah, how you're, you're, you're gonna you're gonna show me you're gonna show me what what's coming out of your computer, and I don't I don't doubt that your computer is spinning out. A bill that's, that it thinks is accurate, but something's wrong. Before you go see me, just read your meter. You know, manually read your meter. So whenever I go see you, do I get behind? Do, do I get to get behind the, the bulletproof glass and come up there? Or? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll bring you in my office. That bulletproof glass is there for a reason, sir. <laughs> We've been in our house for 20 some years, and our bill has never been able to take Mine's a hundred ten. I forget to turn the faucet on. <laughs> More demand 
yes, sir. You know, all these folks. I mean, just there's 200 homes going to Laverne here, and that's just one subdivision. There's a lot of folks coming into Wilson County. I mean, it's just a growth. You know, we're trying to adapt. Yes, sir. Because all the, the more, the greater the flow, and the and the what means it, it takes that coating off, and that's what that's why you see a lot of discoloration. You know, like I said, we're doing our level best to treat it, and the next thing is a water filtration. But like I said, that is not cheap. But we are looking at it to try to take care of the issue. I'm in for sir. So I got I got two things. I build my house. Even though we get it up here. Out of my closet, and I'm brushing my teeth with my kids in the same room. I guess it's the iron composite, I don't know, but it's, it's just disgusting. It holds up so bad when it's coming down all your closets where you like brushing your teeth. Yeah, this is from the, the mesh. So, is there any way to prevent that? Any way to filter it out? I mean, I see these guys that have the line that comes up like a big horseshoe and it goes through their house. So, that, that they is all have tools. I don't. So that's that's called a, re a, redu a reduced uh, pressure zone uh, valve. It's yeah. like a it's better than a double check valve. It ensures that water is in the back of the system. That's what that is. So it's separate from. So everybody has this. It's, everybody yes everybody has iron in the water. Like I'm on the system too, but again me for for me. Uh, in my case, I had a house in Antonio 14 years. I come out here two years ago, and the first thing, one of the first things I did. Closing the house, put a water software. I didn't even think about it because we were so used to we're so used to that, right? And, but in my case, I rarely, if ever, see discoloration. But that's because I have a system. And again, that was before I knew about any of this, the iron or anything. I just put it in because it was something that we did. <coughs> Is that more likely to happen if you live in a Because I live off the county road, right outside the city here. There's hardly anybody around me. There's so many factors. Uh, Let me address that meter again. It came up over here about the uh, intelligent meters. Uh, true story. I've been gone for two weeks. I come back and I hear all these stories about high water bills. I started asking my wife, yeah, ours double and triple too. And uh, she didn't she didn't do anything in that meter. So I went down and <coughs> There it is. Shows exactly when that meter comes on. She's got it set twice a week. Runs in the middle of the night, comes on at one o'clock, shuts down about sunrise, about time I'm going out. I could go, I said, okay, go back four months or so when uh, things were more normal. And we had a normal what, uh, bill. And there's the same thing. It's coming on and shutting off at the same times, twice a week. But there's a less water going through. So I've got my next step. I just got back Monday. My next step is to find out what type of meter that is and why it's doing it. This intelligent meter, that could that's probably what my problem is. It somehow or other makes adjustment. And I'll guarantee you, my wife, anything she touches electronic is going to get messed up. So if she doesn't touch that meter. When she has a problem with it, she calls the guy to put it in, he comes out and checks it. If you've got that problem, pursue it. And uh, because it goes on in the middle of the night, I said, you know how long it's been on? She doesn't know because it's in the middle of the night. Well, she goes on in the morning on whatever days it is, and there's a puddle out on the patio. She knows it came on. And uh, we had some bad uh, valves, stuck heads for a while. That probably reduced a little some. So uh, stop in, like Herb says. They can take a look at the record and tell you exactly because, like you said, same meters, never change the meters. It's measured the same water, it's always measured. And if a meter does go bad, somebody mentioned about little gears in there, if those wear, the normal reaction is it's not going to log as much water as it should. So it's probably going to fail on your side. It's not going to start creating too much water. Since we had these, uh been able to account for the water going through these meters, but uh, been able to help a lot of folks. So uh, I can tell you about one lady that she goes, I didn't change a thing. And she was right. I mean she watered from 2 30 in the morning till 5 30 every morning. 
but we're looking at it in the May time frame, and from 5 to 6 o'clock in May, she was putting 240, hour, uh, 240 gallons an hour on the ground. Uh, when we started looking at it in August and September, that last hour of usage was up to almost 1,000 gallons an hour. I said, something changed here, ma'am. Uh, go look at your last two zones that come on during that cycle. And what she found out was that her husband was doing something in the backyard and ran over a couple sprinkler heads with his diesel truck. And that's where she found the leak in. And so for almost a month, she was putting, you know, her sprinkler system would come on and pump that water on the ground. And we were able to kind of give her a clue uh, with that. So, you know, people say all the time that I didn't change the thing. There was a recent article that guy claimed, and I don't know if he's here or not, but he, he, that he made it public, he claimed I had changed the thing. And so I've looked at his record too, and back in May his watering cycle was about three hours long, and it put about 4,100 gallons on the ground, okay? But from September time frame, his watering cycle was about 13 hours long, and he was putting over 12,000 gallons. So be careful what you say. Okay, I understand. I'm not just here as a reporter for Wilson Calvin News. I am also a resident. And I understand your explanations, I guess, for the sprinkler systems. But I know there's more than one person in this room who doesn't have a sprinkler system, myself included, whose bill has doubled. Nothing's different. We don't have a leak. Um, you see it on, on social media. There's not just the one article that was written, you know, the letter to the editor. There's more than just that one. Right. There are people out here who's built in the past two months have doubled or tripled, and, and they don't know, have so. And you just need to come see me because I can tell you what happened. You know, personally, uh, sad. Um, personally, Saturday, uh, I had a leak that started on in my house. It was about 10 gallons an hour. Okay, and um, I, I found this out when I looked back, but then Sunday afternoon we were gone for about two hours, and I came home and one of the toilet fowls uh, in the back of the toilet burst. It okay, popped and it was just spraying water and running through the toilet. And in that time frame, just those two hours, I lost about 250 gallons of water. And so, of course, I shut the toilet off and I fixed it already and I eliminated that leak. I came back and looked at my uh, our system. I could see that that leak started on Saturday and progressively got worse till Sunday <coughs> about four o'clock. And by six o'clock on Sunday night, that's when we came home between five and six o'clock. And I shut it off. And you could see my usage drop to zero. So is calling you the same as when we just call in and speak to whoever answers the phone and they look up our usage and say, no, we don't see a leak on our side or we don't. Nothing indicates. That's what our customer service techs would do, but if you want a little bit more precise analysis, you can come and see me or either Carlos, and we can sit down with you and go through it hour, hour by hour and help you understand it. Her, you, you and I went through it on the phone. We spent about 30 or 40 minutes on the phone going through my bill. And it was Who are you, sir? My name's Brent Briggs. Okay. And we spoke on the phone, and I 100% I agree with you. I used that much water. Don't know how. I mean, I mean, the sprinkler did what it did. Okay, I did can't I send you a copy of that? Yes, okay. I have. And but what you can't tell, what you couldn't tell me, is before May. So we got the new meters in May. I'm more interested. You got, wait, let me correct you. You got a new radio. In May. <laughs> okay, new radio <laughs> in May. We didn't change the meters. We have been changing. We have been putting those meters in for ten years. Okay, I got. You. Well, yes, sir. From last year to this year. I'm using a whole lot more water, and I'm not, I don't have a leak somewhere, I don't have a, I mean, my sprinkler system, when you Google what the type, what brand of head it is, and what serial number and everything, I'm using exactly what it says I'm supposed to be using an hour, and it's just more water this year than it was last year, and that's what I don't understand. So, I mean, my sprinkler system is set the same, we're supposed to be using about the same amount of water, but I mean, the bill has just increased from last year to this year. Yeah, and you can you can, you ask a big question of how do you know this? I mean, in the meantime, you you I encourage people with 
irrigation system, like especially the first part of the year, to go out and run each zone about five minutes. You know, read the meter first, go out and run the, run the uh, zone for five minutes, uh, time it, go back and read the meter, okay? Um, if, and then go to run the next zone for five minutes, time it, read the meter, and come up with the gallons for those five minutes. You have uh, five zones that have six heads on it, and they're all the same type of heads. Uh, you should be pretty darn close in that five minute time frame. But if you have four of them that are reading 20 gallons, and then you've got this fifth one or so that is reading, you know, 48 gallons, and you know you got a leak somewhere in that piping system in that, that zone. Well, I mean, we did math about 12, 12 gallons a minute for my structure system. Sir, not, not to cut you off, but there's some other folks I'd like to get to the questions, but please come in. Uh, if you have more questions, we can go over it. Uh, I'll go one more time. Okay. Sir, one thing, Bruce was talking about gallons coming out. Uh, how much, how many inches does that put, X gallons put on your yard, depending on your area? If you really want to check that, get you a pipe band, straight sided pipe band, and set it out there in the area that you're watering when you run it. You see when you get a quarter inch, a half inch, or an inch or more, you may be putting the gallons because everybody got different sized yards and those uh, spray heads, you can set them out there they'll put out in the distance. So the, the bottom line is you put a pan out there and catch that water and see how much water is falling on the ground. I'm just interested in what changed from last year to this year. So, oh, and by the way, that leak detector, when I was raising birds, that leak detector will pick up the minor leak. If I had a float valve in one of the water tanks that was just oozing, I could see that thing slowly turn. Very accurate. Um, My question is, over the years, I have called SS Water on the deceleration plant, and we've been in our house for 21 years. This has been going on for 21 years. I called all the time, and even three or four years ago, y'all saying, we're putting in a filtration system. It'll cost about a million dollars. Okay, now it's up to two million? It's so more than that. Right now, y'all have 17,000 residents, and you multiply that on an average of $40 a month, that's $680,000 a month y'all are making. Why is it taking so long for y'all to put in a filtration system? Right, but that money that comes in, I know that's before all the bills are paid. I and all that stuff. But, Chemicals, I mean. Well, you raised it two years ago. Yes, specifically. All the filtration on 539. And, yeah. and why can't y'all even get a laundry night if, if you have to? Right, so there's a couple issues there, right? So in the time that the rates have gone up, we have managed to save a million and a half dollars. So we are saving. But again, this uh, these plants that we talk about, um, what something was projected to cost in today's dollars. If we don't buy it today, a few years from now, it's going to be more because of cost of material, inflation, there's all kinds of things that happen between when we begin talking about installing a filtration system uh, until the time that we actually get engineering plans and begin construction, then the costs, they, they just go up. What about They're, the osmosis system? That looks more reasonably priced. It's actually a little bit more expensive, but the life cycle maintenance is much lower. So, and that's another example. There's so many variables we have to look at before installing the system, but we are looking at yeah, it. Yeah, we're at the costs. very end of the line on Wilson Bear Camp. We are at the end city of view? everybody yeah, in view? home place. In home place? Yes. Yeah, and so we get hit the hardest. And that little white powdery stuff you give us, that stuff stinks to put in your clothes to wash. What the heck is that? It don't even smell good. What kind of oh, chemical the, uh, is that? Iron oh, from the iron out. The iron out? Uh, it's a, it's I mean, really, who wants to put that in their clothes? Again, that is a... My cows. Again, we, we are aware and we're trying to... Like you said, you've well, been 20-something years, but and we are... Well, doing actually, y'all been in business for 48 years. Right. I mean, you know, come on. And then on top of that, I call GCEQ, and y'all's iron level is way above what it should be. 
the max should be 0.03. They told me y'all have 1.89. Right, but that's a, right. that's a, yes, that's not a regulated um, mineral like lettuce. Um, it's considered, technically considered a nuisance, which we treat for. Right? There, there isn't a minimum contaminant level of FCL. You'll see FCLs all over the test water watch. Uh, there is no minimum for that. Uh, you can see relative levels of highness, but again, even if it's 0.3 or 1.7, these are parts per million that we're talking about. Very small numbers here, but collectively, uh, as the water goes through our system, it collects in those pipes, and yes, over time, we do see it, but we are treating for it, and we are doing our best in the future to save and get plants, but it takes time and money. Yeah, I know, but so. I think y'all would do a lot better on the filtration system. I mean, years and years and years, everybody's been putting up with this, and it's just getting to the complaint, and... We're saving. Just, uh, takes, yeah, yeah. It takes well, the gentleman said, just call him. Just call him. Yeah, just call him. Watch out your lines. We'll come in the street. Everybody gets fine with that. I can tell you. We're having water meters that are being replaced. Your filter's in your fridge monthly instead of every six months. It's getting ridiculous. Uh, what, is, what is the chlorine level in the water when you guys distribute it out? Like, what level is the back? Sometimes so, I'll open up the faucet and it's like chlorine, and then other times it's not. And then like the next day it will be, it's kind of like sporadic, but so what level of the guys? So you should be sensing the chlorine. Um, the, chlorine the chlorine is a poison gas, but at the levels that we use to treat, you should not be noticing chlorine. It's strong. Um, it's, it's, it's strong. It's, it's, it's like it's strong. It's strong. It's strong. So it may it may smell like chlorine, but I'm pretty sure it's not because if it wasn't poisonous. You just right. open the closet and well, you're like saying it's not like chlorine. No, sir, uh, I didn't I didn't say that. All right, so I, I didn't say. Where do you live at? I live in Rosewood. So, yeah, I know. So in Rosewood, Kycaster area, you we inject up to about 1.3 parts per million of chlorine. But we can't smell that. We're, we're not smelling that. No what? And at the end of the system, it has to have a residual of 0.2. You can, some people's nose are more sensitive to chlorine than other folks. Uh, you know, we, we've had people say, you know, that it, it smells worse than their pool. A typical pool has about 0.3 parts per million in it for chlorine. You continually fight this infection because it's open to the air and bacteria but in your system, I can guarantee that you'll never see more than about 1.4 uh, because we monitor that on about every 15 minutes we get reports on the chlorine levels that is injected and that's measured at the tanks. So when do you guys know when to do it? It's do done automatically, man. As the water flows through the pipe, there's chlorine that's injected up to a certain level and then we have uh, detectors and measurements in the clear wells, which is a, the ground storage tank. And so on that particular system, going out in that direction, the most that you'll ever have chlorine will be about 1.4 parts per million. And if it drops down in that, in that system, if it drops down below 0.8 parts per million, we're going to get along. Because we also have requirements in different parts of our systems because we're one of the few groundwater systems that is called that's, that's uh, regulated and what's called four log certified so we're just like a surface water plant in the surface water business there's a lot more nasty stuff that you have to worry about and so you have to inject a certain amount of chlorine you have to have a certain amount of contact time you have to have and you have to prove to the state of texas that you can kill 99.9% .9 of any bacteria that may get into your water, okay? And so we're able to do that here in a groundwater system, we're one of the few groundwater systems that is for log certified. And so at, to keep that at different plants, uh, we have different requirements of what, how much chlorine to put in the system. And at the one that serves you, that's what we have about anywhere from about 1.35 up to about 1.4. And that's parts per million.
Would she more likely smell that maybe in the morning when there's less water being used throughout the system? It just depends. Some people's nose are more sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. Then, like, yeah. yeah, because a lot of times you won't smell the, the hydrogen sulfide as long as there's more. You should, have, you should have been around in the 50s and smell the uh, rock days. Yeah, I know. Uh, and I, I, we, we know that a lot of people want filtered water. Well, out here, we want they want a filter system. But I have just as many people that don't want to pay for filtered water. That's true. Well, I'm just saying we have you know, 6,000 customers on our system, and. And there are some customers that, that have trouble affording the water bill right now. And if we're going to provide filter water to your house, it's going to come at a cost. Well, let me ask you this. All because these new homeowners that are building homes, why aren't you letting them know, hey, before you build, you might want to think about putting something, yeah, a whole house filter before you start building or put that in there. Why aren't y'all doing that? To we let do them do know, like, you're going to have problems. We do yeah, do that in most cases. If somebody asks us some personal advice, we don't. You know, we're a member-owned water supply corporation. We're not. So, and, and in, in most cases, that's going to be a lot cheaper for you to get a whole house filter. As Carlos said, in San Antonio, you have hard water. Now, they're not going to soften it for you, okay? No matter how much you get upset about the hard water, they're not going to soften it for you. And you're going to be pulling line crystals out of your strainers. You're going to be clogging up your three-quarter inch line where you only have about a quarter of an inch of, of pipe going through there. Unless you go out and purchase a water softener, okay? In the same way, if, if, if you're going to live on our system for a while um, and you don't like the iron and you can't deal with the iron, you may want to consider a whole house uh, filter. I don't know if you can do that after the house. Certainly you can. Yes, ma'am, you can. You can. Any home can be a half filter. Sir. Yeah. Sorry, that now I get to use. Yeah. 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 So we do have a master plan where we projected growth, I think, 50 years out? It's not even based on a time frame. It's, it's, on, based it's on, on certain gates. Yeah. So you're not going to like the answer where that depends. It depends on how much we can save and how much the cost of the system is that we decide to go with. Um, I can tell you so that with a, with a sand filtration system, Something that large is centralized. We cannot have that, you know, one in each well. So, exactly, and the cost. With that other system, it's uh, more modular. Um, they, they're called skids, and each unit's not only self contained, but they can be designed to treat our water. And, uh, it's a one unit, and you can drop it. It's much easier to bring online. That's another option. Uh, but the, again, the cost. So you pay for that convenience. Is so there anything else? Especially in the water business, things are really expensive. And so, so a year ago, we went out and bought uh, 23 acres on the County Road 319. And uh, our master plan about a year ago, we had a centralized filtration system to where we pumped uh, about six wells to County Road 319. Uh, filtered it there with a sand filter. The reason we had to buy 23 acres is because you have to do something with that iron that you filter out of the water. And so uh, it was cheaper to buy land, 23 acres of land, believe it or not, than it was over about a five-year period to pay to permit and have that iron hauled off. So we bought that land. It has a big tank in it, a pond or whatever, and our 
theory at that time was to, to filter the iron, put it into uh, a, that pond when we, because you have to back to wash that iron. The iron, the sand filters are just like your pool filters. If you have a pool, uh, you have to back wash that, you know, a week or every four or five days or something like that. And so you lose a lot of your water production. Your water production goes way up. We think it'll probably be about the same because we do a lot of flushing now. But still, you're going to lose a lot of that water. And then we're going to put in that pond, and then we're going to spread it out over that 23 acres. And then we'd have to, from that point, we'd have to pipe it back to the, to the other parts of the system, too. So that double the piping. Now, the reason you have to do that is because if you have a well site, and you're pumping water out of that, you just can't put a sand filter right there at that well site. You have no place to put the iron. And you, you have to go build ground storage tanks and high service pumps and all those kinds of things to be able to backwash that sand filter. And so at that time, it was cheaper to go out and put this centralized system in, even though it was, you know, the, the, the actual filtration maybe was going to cost a couple of million, two point five million dollars. Uh, but the piping system and the distribution system that you're going to have to build was added on to that cost, but it was cheap, still cheaper than building all the pumps and the tanks and everything in each individual site. Um, and so that's what we've been saving for, okay? Along comes this, this system called Purific. So they've used it in Canada. Carlos went out to, uh, uh, where was that? Mississippi. Mississippi. They have a plant in operation there. Uh, you never want to be the guinea pig for the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality because that cost you a fortune. Uh, so we don't want to be the first. He went out with a, a Church Seguin Local Government Corporation, which they're sitting at about 60% design on their system with this iron filtration. What's neat about it is the maintenance cost is going to be a lot lower, uh, which is uh, an advantage to our, our members. And, uh, and, and when the iron comes out of there, it's more of a cake type iron. You can put it in a dumpster, and they say that you can dispose of it in a landfill. We're even looking at a possibility of selling it to somebody, or you know, there may be a market for it out there somewhere. Uh, and what, but what's nice about it is it, it uses like a da dynamic shock to keep these ceramic filters clean, and therefore you don't have this huge backwashing problem, and you don't have this huge waste problem that you got to get rid of. And so we're watching and, and waiting and saving money and hoping that. Uh, Church Seguin local government authority gets the approval for TCQ approval for this. Uh, uh, it's more than a pilot. They're going ahead and building a 3.5 GP. Six. Six, point, yeah, six million gallon per day plant. And uh, when that all gets built and approved, and, uh, we'll, 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 and if everything works out like they're advertising, we're hoping to go in that direction. And then that, that way we'll be able to put filtration at each well. Drilling wells. Is there a restriction as to how many wells you can drill in a certain area? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You have uh, spacing requirements, uh, so you can't uh, cause problems from one well to the other well. Um, you, uh, you know, you you got to. We have to go to the Evergreen Underground Water Conservation Authority and permit those wells, and you, and you know, there's all kinds of rules.
15 years ago, they were talking that you could just go out and fill a big old concrete wall as big as this room and fill it with sand and have an open top and pump water through it and filter out the iron. And that's what some systems did, uh, very cheap. But the state won't allow you to do any of that anymore. I wouldn't advertise that. I mean, you have birds flying over that and all that kind of thing. Uh, it's, no, just, it's just not the way to go. It is will, will that um, will that system end in five years or so? Since we're saying what we're doing, are we going to have to change our rates to cover the additional costs, or is that kind of rate enough to cover that? Uh, we won't have to because we're saving our money as we speak, and that yeah. comes out of the capital improvement fund that retains right. earnings every year. Right. But anytime we add treatment to to the water, that comes as a maintenance cost. Right. It'll be, it'll be maintenance. And so yes, it will. It, it could possibly raise the rates and the filtered sure. water would, yeah. But, but we're not going to spike the bio system, we're just going to cover the Yes, sir. Okay, one thing, we mentioned the cost, of, Carlos mentioned we started back in the 70s with an initial loan. We paid that off about what, five, six years ago? Initial loan over all these years, we've been paying on that. We've been setting this money aside, it's been mentioned several times. The last several wells we've drilled and those elevated tanks, we paid cash for those. We have not taken out a loan. Somebody mentioned, yeah, that's a possibility. Take out a loan to put the filters in right away. But we've got to pay that loan back. And then your rates will be paying uh, principal and interest on that loan. And we're trying to avoid that by in our installation fees and everything to, to put that. But one of the bottom lines is I know there's some people that just believe and they say our water is crappy. That's the word they use. Uh, our water is not crappy. I mean, we have iron. Iron is not a contaminant. Iron is a constituent. And the difference is, is that iron is a nuisance problem. It discolors clothes, okay? Uh, it makes the water look bad. We have a responsibility to provide uh, potable water, which means it's safe to drink. And the only time you will be able to tell if there's not potable water in your tap, because as you drive into your on your road and into your subdivision, if you see a boiled water notice on in your in, on the streets or in front of you, you know that that water is not safe to drink. It may not be bad, but we cannot guarantee that that water is bacteria free. We just can't guarantee it. It doesn't mean it's bad. You can take your chances if you want, but we're telling you. Make sure you boil it before you cook with it or you drink it, okay? Um, so we deliver, and as long as I've been here, I'm not going to walk, knock on wood or anything like that because our technicians are very good at this. Uh, we have not had a boiled water notice, okay? And so that's, that's a great deal for us. Um, but we also have a responsibility to provide you palatable water. Palatable water means it looks good, smells good, tastes good, tastes good, and sometimes it doesn't look good. But even if it doesn't look good, I will come to your house and I will take <coughs> your faucet and I will take a cup of water and drink it. And I've had people say, ooh, that looks, you know. Now don't bring it to my office because you're not a water license or you don't have a license to carry it from your tap to my office. I don't know where it's been in between. Don't come into my office and tell me to drink it because I'm not going to do it. But I'll come to your house and drink it right out of the tap. And uh, you know, I've been quoted as saying that and I have said that. It's one of the few true things that gets put on their clothes. So people that are worried about their, their clothes, can't they just put a filtration thing on their washing machines? And just filter it right there? You, you I mean, probably want to. RV park, you have your water hose, and it comes to your, part of your RV, and a lot of people have the filters. The filter yeah, you may want to talk to a plumber or something. It's like a refrigerator, like you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. it's simple. So, who, who maintains the tanks? Like, does somebody come out and maintain it? Or we have our tanks. We can do it day to day. It needs to be maintained. There's trees going on it, there's branches, the aerators that are up there, the screens. Oh, those aren't in operation. Those, those tanks and the aerators there. They're, oh, the retired ones? They're, they're done. They're, oh, they're retired, yes. So, where does our water come from? In that area. It comes from 319 and then it goes into those storage tanks that are right there. That uh, It's called, uh, it, 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 um, it 
it's an elevated tank, but only the top portion of it provides the pressure. So it's called a standpipe. Right there, Mike. Uh, but then you fire station? <coughs> ESD1 right there on the corner of uh, Sunset Bottom Tank. That's one of our elevated towers, okay. but if you go down 324, you've got that plant there with the building and those old aerators yeah, that are back yeah. there. And then so right beside like, it, that's gone. Yeah, but right beside it, that tank is where that water is stored. It's in a separate yeah, yeah, fence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no so concern. nothing comes out of that, that's like. Here, out of that aerator where those, yeah. yeah the that's the Sorry. Everything hangs out there. So. Yeah, we need to get somebody like a junk person to come and cut down. So my question is a little bit more global and a little bit kind of down the road. We get we get our water from the uh, office, correct? Yes, sir. So the last five six years, it's been wet seasons. So there's been no real drain on the aquifer per se. You know, the last five years, we've seen more even more than that. There's been extensive population growth, much to our both in San Antonio and now we're starting to come over this side of the world. So once we start hitting those dry years, which we had the 2015, I believe, um, we had a couple of years of pretty significant drought. Is that how we're going to be able to support uh, the customer supply? And with that being said, as we start seeing the water drop, we obviously it's the water con we have to do water conservation. They'll say you can only water in such and such days and then do all these different things. Well in California about a decade ago or so, they were running the same issues, and so then they were doing massive water conservation. Oh, if you're not using as much more water as you were before, so we have to raise the rates because you're not using That's a that's a or long term. So, so bottom line is is the aquifer going to be able to support? So a couple different questions have. The first is the aquifer for the foreseeable future. Yes, this aquifer, the Cabrillo Volcans, is massive, huge aquifer, multi layers. The thing is, as like I said, I was calling sweet water. That's not really a term I was using it now. The good, easily accessible water. That water at some point will be depleted, and then we have to drill deeper into the aquifer to get water, which is there, but it may not be as good a quality initially as the water we're getting now. It'll require more treatment. Um, as far as the, um, the conservation, um, so there are a lot of parts of that, but as far as conservation goes, so we, our system as it, as it is today, we simply do not have the capacity to uh, support our membership watering as much as they want. We, we just don't have it. Um, we were hearing earlier, you know, that the, our, our system is essentially a static pressure gravity fed. Those tanks can and will deplete if they are not kept up. If the pumps that we have, and we have so many, so many wells, if more water is coming out that is able to be replenished and treated, then yes, it can affect the system to include fire flow. There's a fire, all these little water fires out here. You know, if we can't support that, that's a problem. So that's just one reason why we have year-round conservation conservation measures uh, to ensure against situations like that. So that's just one. So let me be clear about that. The state requires that for every connection we have, we have to have 0.6 gallons per minute from a water source, and I have to have 200 gallons of water. Based on the number of connections we have, we have built the system seven times that amount. But that's still not enough to keep up with some of the thirsty landscapes that we have in some of the subdivisions. And I've had I've had folks tell me on the phone and come to my office and tell me things like, that's ridiculous. And I say, I do agree with that. That's ridiculous that we pump 106,000 gallons in a month's time on the ground. Because if everybody wanted to pump 106,000 gallons of water on the ground, I couldn't build a system big enough to make that happen in the summertime. And so that, those are the, the concerns that we have. Uh, we've had some years of drought. We do 
where people just try to keep landscapes alive. And just, you know, and so we come in one night and, and our tanks would drop about eight to ten feet. Remember that pressure I was talking about? So every, you know, that drops the pressure too. And by the next day or the next morning, we couldn't recover that. And so it would even drop further. And then we couldn't recover that and it would drop further. And so we were getting at a point where you know, we might not have had enough pressure if there was a fire in a subdivision somewhere to be able to come out there and hook up a fire truck and actually fight a fire. And that, that was a concern. And the other thing with this iron and the water quality, it really helps us to maintain uh, the discoloration complaints by asking people to water on different days uh, so that everybody's not watering at the same time and increase the velocity of lines and stirring up some, some more iron. So that's your that's your answer to the flushing because when I was in Compass Cove, this drove me absolutely bonkers because I let's say it again. There was a huge water there was a huge water deficit somewhere north. Uh, there was a water main break in uh, Bridgewater. Right. Yes, sir. So they were having to pump water in. Or they were in the truck water in to the city. Well, we're sitting here, right outside where I was renting the house. That fire, that fire blood was just gushing because they were trying to keep it. Oh, you're talking about over in the golf course or well? Uh, no, this was a, this was just dumped in the street where I lived in the Congress Cove. But we were flushing there. Uh, no, up towards Colleen, Texas. Yeah. So anyway, this is my example. Oh, so, I'm, okay. so what I'm saying is. Your answer to this dumping just like water out of the fire closet to irrigate on these different days. We have a flushing schedule that we that we go through each and every month. Where and most of them are dead end lines that are required by the state. So yeah. Hey, most of us watch TV and we're used to watching. We hear them talk about the level of the upwater. That's a totally different pocket. It's like a big underground tank. Major level. We don't do that. We trigger conservation to a degree based on the storage of water. Everybody starts sucking water, we may go say prescribe water. It's not what has anything to do with the other time. Well, the set thing. That's right. They, they face it every night. They tell you the level of the aquifer. Our aquifer hasn't significantly gone down yet. We do have a plan. I've been on the board for 20 years. And years ago, we did a study. We may have to go to this 